The Nintendo Switch isn't like anything I've seen before. It claims to be a console and a handheld, a concept which definitely had me excited. Honestly, I've been excited ever since I first heard rumors that it would be a hybrid console with detachable controllers, and I was really excited when we saw that first reveal trailer and saw that that's actually exactly what it was. Let's talk about if it lives up to all that. So first, let me explain exactly what the Switch is. The Switch is a tablet that can be played on the go or as a console at home connected to your TV using a docking station. If you want to go from handheld to console mode, you just drop it into the dock and vice versa. The dock, by the way, feels awesome. There's basically no force required to put the Switch in or take it out, so it feels really great switching modes. It doesn't even feel like you're plugging a charging piece in, which you actually are. On the left and right sides, you'll find Joy-Cons, which slide off if you want to play in TV mode or if you want to prop the Switch up on its built-in kickstand to play tabletop mode with a friend. The Joy-Cons are really cool and there's a lot of interesting technology in them, and to be clear, together the two of them form one controller. You can slide them into the Joy-Con grip to play in a kind of normal controller form factor, but to be honest, I didn't like this that much, and I literally haven't touched it since my second day with the Switch which is about a month ago now. It's not that there's anything wrong with the grip in general, it's a pretty decent solution. It's just that for me, the far superior way to play is with one Joy-Con in each hand entirely separated. It's really comfortable, you can lay however you want without having to put your hands together, and it's actually really great. It doesn't really take any getting used to at all, it's just really intuitive. I've literally used the Switch in tabletop mode on a coffee table in front of me while laying on a couch with my head propped up like this with a Joy-Con in this hand playing Zelda, and it was awesome. That is comfort. <laughs> The right Joy-Con houses an IR camera that can detect shapes, something we haven't seen a whole lot of yet, but it is there. And what the IR camera is not for, however, is Wii-style pointer input. That said, Human Resource Machine and other games from Tomorrow Corporation use the gyro and the accelerometer alone for pointer input with just a button to recalibrate if it gets off-center, and it actually works quite well. It's pretty cool. The right Joy-Con also has an NFC chip for using Amiibo with your games, and both Joy-Cons have the new HD rumble feature that is basically meant to be able to give you a really advanced haptic feedback. There's a 1-2 Switch minigame where apparently the Joy-Con gives a really realistic feeling of being able to feel marbles in it. I've heard from people that this does work quite well, but I haven't tried it personally. I do know that Fast RMX has HD rumble, and to be honest, the way it's used in that game, I didn't really feel anything different. But that's not to say there's nothing there. Uh, maybe I'm just not really noticing it. I've heard people say you can really feel where the car is getting hit. I don't know. And that's just one specific game. I haven't tried it with enough to say that it's not a thing. I've heard the marble thing is pretty cool, so... There's also a Pro Controller you can buy if you want bigger buttons, bigger analog sticks, and a more controller-like experience. The aforementioned Pro Controller also has HD rumble and NFC for your Amiibos, but not the IR camera. The big thing with the Joy-Cons, however, is that in certain games like Snipper Clips and Fast RMX, both of which are great games by the way, and Mario Kart when it comes out, is that you can use each Joy-Con as its own controller for these games for multiplayer. Think about that for a second. That means that for certain games, you get two controllers out of the box. I've been loving playing Sniper Clips and Fast RMX with friends, and it's especially great since I'm someone who didn't buy a second controller for my PS4 until I had owned it for probably two years. Now, another set of Joy-Cons is expensive. It's $80 US and $100 Canadian plus tax. However, when you consider that that's two controllers, it's more acceptable in my opinion. It's, you know, more expensive than a PS4 or an Xbox One controller, but cheaper than two, so it makes sense to me. 
I do plan to get a second set very soon, and once I do, I'll be able to play four player in a lot of games, and I'm actually really excited for that. And for the record, I don't know of a single multiplayer game that's out currently that can't use one Joy-Con each. There probably will come games where you need two Joy-Cons or a Pro Controller each. For example, if Splatoon 2 has local multiplayer like Splatoon 1 did, I can't imagine them ever being able to do one Joy-Con per player. You'd need either a full set each or a Pro Controller. But a lot of games actually support it, and it's really super cool. But having multiple controllers means nothing if they aren't comfortable. Fortunately, I actually find the Joy-Cons pretty good considering what they are and how small they are. Like I said, they're great using them both for one person, but I'm talking specifically about local multiplayer here. As long as you're using it with the included wrist straps, they feel really good. I always use them, but one day my girlfriend and I decided to race in Fast RMX and we forgot to put the wrist straps on. To clarify, the wrist straps make the controller a little taller so it's bigger and also extend the buttons on the top, the shoulder buttons. Now, without the wrist straps, I can't lie, one Joy-Con each actually felt really uncomfortable for me and my girlfriend said she didn't like it at all either. But the wrist straps are included and only take a second to put on and they're small enough that they fit in the carrying case I bought for my Switch. So I'm really not going to complain. Like I said, the idea that one controller is actually two controllers kind of weighs out the cons here for me. One last cool feature of the Joy-Cons is that the two trigger buttons that exist on each one on the top vertically also exist on the side that's normally hidden when the Joy-Con is railed onto the Switch. These work as the shoulder buttons when you're using one Joy-Con each for multiplayer because you hold it horizontally that way. And that's actually really cool to me. And like I said, the, uh, the wrist strap makes those buttons taller. I've seen a lot of people worried more than anything else about the proximity of the buttons on the Joy-Con to the analog stick when you're playing multiplayer. And this hasn't been an issue for me. I can see the concern, I won't lie, and I've only played a few multiplayer games, so maybe something more intense would have a problem with it, but for me, it has been fine. One last thing I'll say about each Joy-Con as a controller is that I also bought a set of these Joy-Con holders, two of them for $13 Canadian, really just out of intrigue to see how they were, and they feel pretty good if you're not into the wrist straps. They also came with uh, thumbstick tops, so that was kind of cool too. Some people have been having issues with the dock scratching their screens, which sounds pretty bad, I know. There's even been speculation that there are two different versions of the dock. I haven't experienced this at all, though I've been using a screen protector most of the time, and I'll say two things in general. This doesn't seem to be the norm at all, and everybody seems to be getting really good support when they contact Nintendo. They will help you if you call. And with a console like this, you're probably going to want a screen protector either way. I got a tempered glass one on Amazon for $15 Canadian, and it's been great. I really, really recommend this, especially because the screen is plastic. Now, that actually has a major pro and a major con. Basically, the screen is more flexible than glass, and it should be a lot more forgiving if you drop it. It shouldn't shatter. If anything, it might crack, but probably won't ever get it completely smashed, unless you're really trying to. On the flip side, plastic is a lot softer, and that means it's definitely easier to scratch. So seriously, I recommend a screen protector for this if scratches are going to bother you. In my opinion, there's nothing that makes a new device feel not brand new anymore faster than a scratch on the screen. Now, Nintendo rates the battery life between 2.5 and 6 hours, depending on what you're playing. So intensive games like Zelda will be close to the 2.5 to 3 hour mark, whereas less demanding games like Shovel Knight or Snipper Clips should be much longer. I've gotten almost exactly 3 hours out of Zelda a few times now, which I'm very happy with. Having gamed on laptops a decent bit, I know they normally have pretty bad battery life when you're gaming. So to see a console tier game like Zelda run for three hours on battery is plenty to impress me, especially when this also functions as a home console, and in my opinion, very well. It doesn't feel like uh, some sort of a half console experience. It really doesn't. Also, Zelda is so good. I put over 90 hours into the game before I even beat it. 
Right now, it's by far the biggest game on the system, with a lot of the other games being indie games. In fact, if you like indie games, this might actually be a dream machine for it. There are a ton announced, including some even exclusives like Runner 3 that won't come out on anything but the Switch, and even timed exclusives that will appear on the Switch first. The Stardew Valley console version will get multiplayer first on the Switch. It'll come to PC first, but for consoles, Switch first. So that's pretty cool. Now, right now, there aren't a ton of AAA games out, or even announced, from third parties. But Nintendo actually has a relatively big lineup. You've got Mario Kart 8 Deluxe coming out April 28th, Arms in the Spring, Splatoon 2 in Summer, Skyrim in the Fall, and Mario Odyssey Holiday Season. Plus, you've got Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and Fire Emblem Warriors both coming this year, 2017, as well. So right now, I'm looking forward to a lot of those, and I think we're definitely going to be hearing more soon. It really seems like this time around, Nintendo is making sure that if nothing else, this console gets lots of Nintendo games, which to me is a really good start. Probably the biggest thing I wish the console had right now is Virtual Console for playing older Nintendo systems like Super Nintendo and N64, and maybe even GameCube, wouldn't that be nice? Followed by apps like Netflix and a web browser. But Virtual Console is definitely coming for at least some systems, and I can't wait to get my hands on all those Nintendo classics, and I think apps like the browser and Netflix will be coming soon too. I should also note that this is going to be the first Nintendo console where the online multiplayer is a paid service, but it's going to be free up until fall 2017, and based on some comments made previously by Nintendo, it does also seem like it's going to be cheaper than Xbox and PlayStation online services, but we don't know the exact price yet. On one final technical note, I'm really glad Nintendo went for USB-C for the charging port instead of something proprietary. Have you got a phone with USB-C? Great, your charging cable should work fine with the Switch. Some people have complained about its placement on the bottom because you can't charge it in tabletop mode or rest the Switch on anything while you're playing in handheld mode and charging. And while it is a little bit unfortunate for those use cases, I don't really see much better options. Maybe if the Joy-Cons could go on both ways and you could flip the screen, that would work. So that if you're playing handheld mode, you could flip it over. But that, I don't know. I think it's really understandable and generally fine. So at this point, what can I really say about the Switch? Well, I really love it. It's not as portable as a 3DS though. You can't just throw it in your pocket. But if you're taking a book bag anywhere already, or if you've got a purse, you can definitely throw it in a lot more easily than a laptop. Do you have a purse that you can fit a laptop in? That'd be impressive. The nature of this system is just really versatile, and whenever I want to pick it up and go portable, I just take it out of the dock and it's charged and ready to rock. <laughs> that rhymed. It's really, really cool. I will say that I would call this a soft launch, and if you're not into Zelda, it's kind of hard to recommend buying one right now, unless you just want a lot of indie games to be portable. And I'm seriously not bashing that at all. I'm just saying that if you want a lot of bigger titles, you're going to have to wait a little while. By holiday season, I think this thing is going to have a lot of really great games, both indie and AAA Nintendo. And all in all, what kind of games you're into is going to be a huge part of the decision of whether or not you want to switch. It's less powerful than a PS4 and an Xbox One. No one's denying that. And the kind of games I got it for, that's no big deal. To me, the kinds of games Nintendo makes, everyone else stopped doing years ago. Indie games like Ukulele and Shovel Knight are doing a great job of bringing back other styles of game. But Nintendo also has certain exclusive properties that I can't wait to play. Things like Mario, Zelda, Mario Kart, Mario Party, <laughs> lots of Mario, and stuff I've never played before, like Xenoblade Chronicles and Fire Emblem, both of which, like I said before, are coming to the Switch in 2017. Though this Fire Emblem game is more of a spin-off. Basically, if you're trying to decide between a Switch a PS4, and an Xbox One is your only console, and the games you want to play are Shadow of War and Call of Duty, then you shouldn't get a Switch, because those games aren't confirmed for the Switch, and a lot of them won't ever come to it, probably. But if you're into the kind of games Nintendo brings, like 3D Mario, 
an awesome Zelda, maybe even some 2D Zelda or Pokemon, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of them soon. And if you're into the unique portability features, and maybe you love the idea of bigger indie games on the go, like Ukulele on the go, sounds pretty awesome. Hopefully that game really holds up because it looks great. Then the Switch is, in my opinion, an excellent choice. Even if you want to wait a while for more games, because to be honest, if you're not into Zelda, there's not much reason to get it yet. This still looks awesome, and I do think you should get it eventually. Like I said, it's all going to depend. If this sounds great to you, it probably would be great for you. And if it sounds terrible to you, then it's probably not for you. So that's it, guys. My review of the Nintendo Switch. Sorry it took so long, I was busy playing it. Have you got a Switch? Are you thinking about getting one? What do you think about it? Let me know with a comment down below. If you like this video, please like it. That helps me out a ton. And if you loved it, subscribe and ring that bell to get a notification when I post. I'll be doing a video review of the Galaxy S7 really soon if you're interested to see how last year's flagship holds up. If you want to buy a Switch, check out my Amazon affiliate links down in the video description, and hopefully someday they'll be in stock. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.